Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is June 4th, 2021, and I have the pleasure of being here with Mari Nieves Alba, a lifelong Bronxite, a mother, author, and educator who's done outstanding work in a variety of organizations fighting specifically for racial and cultural equity and social justice in general. And we begin these oral histories by asking, why don't you tell us a little bit about your family's background and how they ended up in the Bronx? Sure. Um, first, thank you for having me. Um, so my, I'm going to actually begin with my mother's family because they arrived in New York City first. Um, and so my, my family, my ethnic background is Puerto Rican and Panamanian. My mother is Puerto Rican and she was actually born in Brooklyn on Schenectady Avenue um, uh, uh, and moved, moved to the Bronx in 1959, I believe. Um, they moved from Schenectady. So my mom was, she had a home birth. She was born in Brooklyn in her home with her mom and her grandma. Um, she had seven siblings. Uh, most yeah. of her siblings, I believe she was the first sibling. So for, she's the fifth child. And my grandparents had seven children. And my mom was the fifth, born in New York City. All of the others have been born, if I'm not mistaken, in Puerto Rico. Sure. So she, she was the first one to be born in New York City, followed by twin sisters. <laughs> and when she was five years old, um, she started, she actually began kindergarten in the Bronx. Wow. Um, yeah, and I would say, I guess it's the East Bronx. Um, she, she, she remember she told me they moved to Fatelli Avenue. Okay. Um, yeah. to an apartment or uh, an apartment in a private house on Fatelli Avenue owned by Puerto Ricans. And actually, from what I recall, like the block and the neighborhood was primarily um, Jewish and Italian at that time. Sure. So they were the only Puerto Rican family on the block. My mom went to PS 47, then she went to JHS 113, um, and then James Monroe High School. She graduated from James Monroe High School in 1972. Sure. Um, and then my dad came from Panama. He's an immigrant who came from Panama in 1961 mm. and also moved to the Bronx, to Bronx River Avenue, to a private house owned by a Puerto Rican postman. Oh, wow. um, you know, that was his first stop when they arrived in Panama. They were able to rent an apartment from a, a home. I mean, I would say it's, you know, pretty unheard of at that time, particularly in this neighborhood, which at that time was primarily Italian and Irish. Sure. Um, so there was, you know, a Puerto Rican family, postman, owned a home and rented to my family, my Panamanian family. Um, so that's kind of how we ended up here. I was born in Lincoln Hospital. Mm. Um, the new Lincoln Hospital in 1976. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I love, I actually love like digging into the history of Lincoln Hospital because I learned that, you know, in the 19th century, it was a training ground for black nurses. Yeah. Um, and that it has so much political history, right? We know that it was taken over by the Young Lords and the Black Panthers um, in order to ensure, you know, health access, but also in order to address like the heroin crisis that was happening in the South Bronx at the time. My father was a part of that takeover and one of the people along with Matula Shakur um, responsible for the auricular acupuncture program, which was used to do drug detox. And so I, of course, was born, what other hospital could I be born in? I had to be born there. Um, both of my parents actually worked there when I was born or shortly thereafter. So that the hospital is also really important in terms of like, I guess, you know, my family history because my mom worked there for over 20 years and actually my parents divorced and my mom married my stepdad who also worked there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah he was a, eventually became a social worker at Lincoln and then moved on to work at other hospitals. So I was born at Lincoln. Um, I went to St. Helena's uh, Catholic school on Olmsted Avenue Mm. for like two years but I was the chatty quote-unquote the chatty child who like couldn't focus and so they're like we think your child needs like a, according to my parents my brother and I both actually suffered from the same the same illness which is that we talked too much and they thought that we were like you know we needed more more challenging a more challenging environment and it was we talked too much because we were smart kids and we yeah. got bored easily and we did other kids homework so <laughs> um <laughs> In the in the third grade, I went to PS61, the Francisco Oyer School on Cortona Park, because they had a gifted and talented program. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, so I went from St. Helena's to Francisco Oyer, PS61. I graduated from PS61 in the sixth grade. <clears throat> that was actually one of the most formative experiences of my life, I think. Um, oh, really? Because I met a teacher there, 
Mr. Thomas, wherever you are, we will always give you love and honor. Um, he was a Guyanese gentleman, very strict, had been, you know, educated in a British system, obviously, Guyana being a colony of Britain. Um, and he took education very, very seriously. And he was my fifth grade teacher. And because he developed such a strong connection to our class and because he sort of wanted to follow us through to make sure we all got out, um, he ended up transferring to become the sixth grade teacher. So he was our teacher for two consecutive years. Um, I remember he used to do a collection. I think this is like illegal in the DOE now, but he would collect like a dollar from each kid or like 50 cents, but it was whatever you could pay. And then at the end of the week, he would return with a new book. Oh, wow. And because of him in like the fifth and sixth grade, we read Catcher in the Rye, Animal Farm, Fahrenheit 451. Um, the list is long. I, I, he would always come in and everyone would get to keep their book. You yeah. know, he had us reading like these American classics and his, his entire like message to us was about rigor you know, um, and you guys can't afford to leave the school not knowing how to read and write, and you can't afford to not be critical thinkers, and you know, he was very strict and very stern, but everything he did was, like, totally out of love, and yeah. thanks to him, I actually, he helped me to get into, like, a preparatory program, which actually earned me a scholarship to private school. Oh, wow. Um, so after CS61, I went to the Spence School, which is, like, an Upper East Side um, prep school, and I graduated from there, um, you know, in the 12th grade, went on to Wesleyan, NYU, et cetera. But he was, you know, that Bronx sort of elementary school experience was really like, it's just a really important, like formative and like a pivotal moment in my life because one, obviously it's like what propelled me to be able to pursue like other educational opportunities that fundamentally changed my life, but also because Mr. Thomas was like this role model educator. And we had many loving teachers there. I remember Miss Rivera, Miss Cuevas, um, Miss Yakumas. Um, yeah, I remember it was a Greek, a Cuban from Miami, and like an older Puerto Rican woman who ended up living around the corner from my house. Even though I, I lived very far from the school, my neighbor ended up being my fourth grade teacher. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a very small town story, even though the Bronx is a big place. <laughs> It feels like a small town a lot of the times, though. I mean, it's crazy uh, just the way people are connected in the Bronx, um, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, what as as far as as far as your um your public school experience goes, uh, what was from what you remember the student body uh, like at at the school uh, that that particular school that you went to, or your or your class, the gifted class that you were in? Yeah. So at that time, our school was still. Um, it was already, I shouldn't say still, it was already primarily Puerto Rican and African American. Sure. Um, I remember our librarian was like, had been there for many generations and she was an Orthodox Jewish woman. Um, so there was still like that remnant of like when the, that part of the Bronx, was, you know, Cortona Park. Um, the, the other really interesting thing is that when we were in elementary school is when they began construction of all of the private homes around that area. Sure. So there was also like a, there was a, a sort of a emerging consciousness about class and like yeah. in that there were a number of children in my class in the gifted and talented class who were homeowners, which was very uncommon yeah. for the kids. It was a primarily low income community. Um, the gifted and talented program was all children of color. I don't remember any white children actually. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there was an emergency, emerging consciousness around class because it was like, oh, people can own homes in this neighborhood. Yeah. And so, you know, there was, I remember Evelyn, I believe maybe, I don't recall her last name, but it was a young woman who's Puerto Rican family, whose, you know, family had bought one of these brand new homes that was literally around the corner from the school. Um, and another young African-American girl who's also, whose family had bought a private home. Um, around the corner from the school and they were anomalies you know everyone was like wow I lived far away I actually didn't live in that neighborhood at that time I lived my parents were divorced so I lived between my dad's house which was at the time on Leland Avenue mm. in the East Bronx and in on uh, my mom lived in the South Bronx so I grew up primarily living in my mom's but kind of back and forth you know shared weekends and what have you Sure. Um, on Simpson Street. So where I say where I grew up was actually Simpson Street in the South Bronx on East 163rd Street. Yeah. Um, that's like the Longwood section of the Bronx. And so I traveled, you know, and, and actually how I got into the school was that my stepmother was, Joanne Casado, was um, a teacher at the school. 
and she had me tested. Um, so going to the school that was like randomly like located nowhere near any of my homes yeah. was really because I, my stepmom was a teacher. She had actually finished law school and had it. She was studying for the bar and became a teacher in the interim. Yeah. And she was like, this kid needs to be tested. You know, St. Helena's had already kind of kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this kid needs to be tested and I tested into the school um and one of the unique things you know I later obviously later in my career I went on to become a community school director I ran a community school in Washington Heights for over 12 years and one of the tenets of the community school model is like you know an infusion of health and social services in a school community that kind of wraps around the child and the family and what I remember about public school at the time that I attended was that we actually had a really robust program Yes. of health services that were already in the school. So there were dentists and there were physicals and eye exams and hearing exams. And these things were at least, they were a staple of my elementary school education Absolutely. Um, in the 80s, right? And so when I you know, start to do education equity work 40 years, 30 something years later, it's like, oh, like we're fighting for things that we actually had once upon a time that were standard features of our schools. And we were fighting for them as if they're in an innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, when it's, in fact, they've always kind of been part of, of our schools. Arts, you know, the arts were a part of our schools at that yeah, time. Yeah. I was going to um, mention that. I was going to say all of the robust arts and music programs in public schools, which were even, even more well-funded in like the 50s. And then you know, funding was taken away, but people kept fighting and got a little more funding, but it, a constant battle. And the people who say there's not enough money act as if uh, these have never existed, but <laughs> they've been around forever. Um, exactly. And I think it's so interesting, like generationally, like my parents' generation, you know, that's the generation that produced salsa in the Bronx, right? And yeah. it's because those kids, like those Puerto Ricans and African-American folks, had all taken music classes. So, the, you know, salsa is an instrument, it's an orchestra, it's instrument heavy. It's like, you have to be a musician to play salsa, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then my generation loses that. And then what do we create? Hip hop, right? Because we don't yeah. have music education anymore. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you just have to, uh, have to, you know, use whatever tools are at your disposal. But students in, in, in your parents' generation, they could actually a lot of times take the instruments home um right it's, it's crazy um to to think about but uh uh but yeah it sounds like you had a really really wonderful experience in in the public school school system in the bronx so i did i mean i think that's a gifted and talented program and i think that's like actually my first um sort of exposure right or even confrontation with like education and equity right is that the gifted and talented kids like we were on the track, we had Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, and all of our teachers, but Mr. Thomas, like I said, was like the one who really like molded us and made sure we got out with sort of like key pillars, if you will, um, of our experience. And, but the rest of the school was hot, you know, like there were fights and, you know, people got jumped and it was like the, you know, all of the things that you hear about in like an inner city school in the low income community. Um, there were fights in our class. I mean, I actually remember the first, I went, I said I, I got there in third grade. I actually got there in second grade because that's when we had Miss Yakuma. So I'm like digging into my memory. But I remember in the second grade specifically, there was a boy who probably today would be classified as like a special needs child or like differently abled, yeah. you know, neurodiverse, right? Neurodiverse. Um, and I remember that his main issue was like anger. He had like anger management issues that would like disrupt everything. And in second grade, I want to say like the first week of second grade, he like threw a chair across the classroom yeah. <laughs> in the gifted and talented class. So he was also really intelligent, yeah. right? He was also like a brilliant kid, but he was a brilliant kid with like other, with other needs, right? Sure. Um, and so I think like, it was a wonderful experience and it was still public school in the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. We're out, outside of your classroom. All, I'm sure all of the teachers were completely overworked and overstretched and there were far too few resources provided to them and to the students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine Mr. Thomas taking that collection. And Mr. Thomas, he always dressed, you know, he, he, everything about him, he was impeccable in like his dress and his word and his speech um, and very proud and um, 
you know, the fact that Mr. Thomas made the kids. But I remember one thing that he said to us was like, I'm making you pay for these books. Obviously, the book didn't cost 50 cents even in the 80s, right? Yeah, yeah. But he's like, the reason I want you guys to like actually in- pay into these books is because I want you to invest into them because they're going to be yours. And because yeah. you should know that you should actually use your money, right, to pay for things that benefit you and like open doors and pathways to opportunity, right? So you guys spend money on potato chips and candy after school, you can pay for these books. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay for Catcher in the Rye or... <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> that's funny um did you hang around uh after school like in the neighborhood uh, around Cretona Park or did you usually go to one of your parents house for I'm like, trying to remember I feel like I went home because I lived far away yeah so my stepmother usually unless she had a meeting like was like responsible for picking me up and like taking me home so I usually had to like leave with her because sure. you know we lived together or like near closer to one another um and then my stepdad as well would pick me up sometimes so it was like because I lived far away I didn't have much of an after school life but I also don't remember much of an after school program yeah um it was more kids like hanging out you know in front of the on the in front of the park we were like right in front of the park so um yeah or like taking the bus together I discovered one of my biological cousins at that school as well oh wow yeah who I hadn't seen for a very long time because she moved away one like she was in the gifted and talented class so I walked into the gifted and talented class and she's like you're my cousin and I was like oh my god you're my cousin (laughs) (laughs) so again like a small town story you know yeah yeah for sure Um, um yeah so I remember walking to the bus with my cousin to the bus with my cousin um as well after school that's like the extent of it I mean you know second to sixth grade like your parents still aren't aren't letting you do a whole lot by yourself (laughs) yeah definitely definitely um and uh what are things that you remember uh when you did hang out with friends uh in either you know the neighborhood around your your mom's apartment or your dad's apartment what are things that you remember doing with your friends um okay so I was actually telling someone this story yesterday we were um we had this like team check-in at my job and you were supposed to say like what was your favorite thing one of your favorite things to do over the summer as a child and so on Simpson Street um and this is like you know throughout junior high school and high school um even though I went to school in the city and I had a very close-knit group of friends that were actually mostly from the Bronx they were all Bronx girls who got scholarships to Spence as well I was gonna um, you. as well as a few Harlemites and Brooklynites so I had friends all over the city but I had a crew from the Bronx one was from co-op city one was from um sort of the north Bronx you know Hill Avenue the West Indian community up north yeah, yeah, yeah. um one was from Decatur Avenue yeah. uh near Fordham Road so they, we were from all over one was from um uh, near uh, the Stevenson track um you know right over right right across the Bruckner okay yeah um, yeah. yeah Jamie Towers I think So, you know, I had a crew from the Bronx in prep school. It must be noted because that was actually an anomaly as well. They were like, oh, we've never had this many girls of color and we've never had this many girls from the outer boroughs (laughs) in our school. (laughs) Um, But I also had, I also had a a group of friends that were my, my girls from, you know, the, the, literally from my building. It was like my next door neighbor whose family was from Georgia, right? So like black American family who had come up from the South, their granddaughter was one of my best friends. And then down the hall, I live on the sixth floor. I was in 6H and they were in 6A, was like another Puerto Rican family. And it was actually, um, my neighbor adopted her two nieces who were close in age to me. So that was my home base, right? Those are my friends. And what we would do in the summertime is, Believe it or not, yes, still in the eighties. Sometimes my my neighbor uh, from from the south shared a fire escape with me. So when our parents would go to sleep, we would like put pillows and quilts on the fire escape, <laughs> and yeah. it became our balcony. And we would like watch to see what was happening on the street, on the avenue. Um, you know, it was still a time. It's really interesting because you know people talk about the South Bronx at that time was the poorest congressional district in the United States period. Yeah. Um, and due to redistricting, that isn't the case any longer, but it still, you know, has a similar demographic profile um, and similar social indices, right, in terms of education and infant mortality and poverty and all of that. But the interesting thing was that we had a really 
carefree like life and there was a I felt safe there um mostly because something I was telling my son the other day like everyone's mother aunt grandma looked out for all of the young people all of the children so wherever you went there was an adult who had eyes on you who would tell you if you were doing the right or the wrong thing you know um knew to, where to find your mom you know um and we you know we walked I had a poodle I had like a pet poodle and I would I would like walk my dog for four hours and get in trouble for it all the time like, I'm going to walk the dog and it would be like three o'clock and I would come back at seven and I and I didn't go anywhere I was yeah. literally within like two blocks of my front door yeah um but it was because we like to be outside together right Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. and we had actually um that block so that block, was, those are SEPCO buildings, right? And if you yeah. know about like Bronx redevelopment after the burnings, these were like brand new sparkly apartment buildings, very spacious, sure. um, you know, and there were playgrounds built in, there were basketball courts built in. Um, even in the design of the street, there were buildings that faced the sidewalk and then behind the buildings, there were actually playgrounds and green space. Um, which today is no longer because they've now built uh, private houses on top of what used to be the community, like green space and playground. Yeah, yeah. So we actually had like, if I, when I go there now, my mom still lives there. When I go there now, like even the, there was a parking lot. Like if, if you lived in my building, you could, you know, buy parking oh, wow. yeah. and have parking in the South Bronx in the 1980s and 90s. Yeah, that's crazy. Unheard of, right? But that parking lot no longer exists either because they've built affordable housing on top of it. Mm. So what they've done is, I mean, they've made it extremely dense now. Yeah. Um, but back then we had space. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. you know, we were outdoors. We would go to the basketball courts and watch the guys play basketball. We would, you know, we would, sometimes we would be in the hallway, which our parents didn't like. They'd be like, get inside. You're not supposed to be in the hallway. But because everyone knew each other, no one cared. So the kids would gather in the hallway and we would do dance choreography or, you know, we're a bunch of little chatty girls. We sit around, we would literally just like sit on the floor in the hallway and talk. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, we visit each other's houses. We were always bouncing between everyone's apartments. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, that's what I remember. It was just like, I was always with that crew of girls. There were four of us. There was a constellation of friends, so there were, excuse me, there were other people we hung out with, but we were like our own nucleus. Um, and there was a group of guys that we were friends with who were always together. Um, and so, you know, occasionally we would meet up with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one of my best friends, one of my best male friends from the neighborhood from Simpson Street who lived, I lived at 940, he lived at 1000, you know, at the end of the block, is um, we grew up with the kids of like Lorene Padilla. Mm. and blackie right from yeah. the um the savage skulls Two, sure, their sure. children were like my brothers so you know their eldest son and i were the same age and then the younger brothers were like my little brothers so you know we it was a very tight knit simpson street is a very unique place um first of all i have obviously prejudice but <laughs> i learned later in life that like i think in high school i learned like colin powell from simpson street his family yeah. from simpson yeah. street a friend now, she's a dear friend, slightly older than me, Elizabeth Yampierre, who's like a climate activist based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. She's from Simpson Street. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm all about like, we need to make a documentary about Simpson Street. Yeah. But, <laughs> but Simpson Street from East 163rd to Westchester Avenue, which is just one block, is like its own town. It's its own village. And growing up back then, you know, if you were, there was Simpson, then Fox, you know, then Tiffany, Kelly, you keep going. Every block was its own world, and like you didn't necessarily go to the other blocks unless you had family there, right? If you had family there, you had a free pass. And if you had friends, for I think for girls and for women, it was more fluid. For men and young men and boys, it wasn't like sure. boys, they were crews, yeah, for each of the blocks. So, you know, the guys would they could travel as needed but with more i think in a state of greater vigilance like oh we're going to this a block away we're talking about a block away yeah um but it was like oh well there's another crew on fox street so if we go there we have to be careful or we need to go together for safety whereas if you were a female that wasn't the case we just kind of wandered freely 
And then, you know, on the other side of Simpson Street is Southern Boulevard, which is the commercial hub. Sure, sure. And that's, you know, that's Switzerland. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's anybody can go there. Because yeah. um, <laughs> you know, everyone shops, so everyone yeah. can go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Is that, is that where you all would do most of your shopping that you remember growing up? Or were there little, bo like, was there a bodega on Simpson Street that you went to? Or It was on 163rd, there was a bodega. Um, so that was like the bodega, the primary one that we went to. And then my mom did grocery shopping there, but we had a car. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so my stepdad had like preferences about where he liked to do grocery shopping. And often it was like, you know, near like Brook. I, and this is really funny. Like Western Beef had just opened up. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Which yeah. is like a thing because they had a butcher. And in the yeah. Puerto Rican community, we had a butcher on Simpson Street once upon a time, right off of Westchester Avenue, actually. So we would either go to the butcher to get fresh meat. Sure. Like we never bought meat at the supermarket. It was always at the butcher. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but then when Western Beef opened up, it was more convenient because they had a fresh butcher and a supermarket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had to travel there for grocery shopping. Um, and then, no, like, I don't even remember where. But I, I think, like, I would buy party clothes on Southern Boulevard because they always had, like, you know, party. There was a store that specifically specialized in, like, fashion trends. <laughs> And, like, if we were going to a party, I would go there. But, like, my regular school clothes, I wore a uniform. Sure, sure. Um, and then, of course, once I started going to school downtown, we would go to the East Village. That was, like, our thing. Um, you know, we, we were on the Upper East Side, but, like, our hangout was in the, the East Village. So that's where I shopped with my friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what about uh, some of the most memorable things that you remember, um, say, eating growing up or uh, – your parents or step parents cooking most memorable i mean puerto rican food right my my stepdad is um my stepfather is from puerto rico born in puerto rico and didn't come to the u.s i think so he was in like his 20s okay yeah, um yeah. after the army he was in the army then came to the south bronx simpson street he was he was from the reason i ended up on simpson street is because my he and my mom got married um, and we moved to Simpson Street, but his first place was, um, well, I think he moved to Beck Avenue first and then Simpson Street. Um, but in any case, he was from the island and very traditional. So we had to eat rice and beans almost every single day with something, right? Like yeah. mixtura, which is like, you know, chicken or beef or fish or whatever. But like the rice and beans has to be there <laughs> and then everything else is secondary. And of course, plantain and yuca, yautia, you know, vianda. So we call vianda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 lo I love that name for all of the uh, root vegetables, plantains, everything, because it's so, it's so evocative. I mean, like, yeah, anyway, yeah. Yeah, so that was like staple. And honestly, to be really honest, I think like um, I had to be like much older, like high school before my stepdad finally adapted and was like okay fine like we can have pasta <laughs> like really he did and my panamanian family's house we didn't have beans as often um it was a very different it was very different my aunt one of her best friends from school was italian so my aunt actually learned to make like authentic italian food from scratch you know sauces from scratch desserts from scratch everything from scratch um, so there was at the Panamanian household, there was like some standard, you know, like rice and chicken and, but there was a lot of Italian food because my aunt was like, I'm going to master. And she actually is. I personally think she's like a phenomenal Italian cook, chef. Um, but in the Puerto Rican household, it was traditional Puerto Rican food. Like I said, eventually we adapted. The first time I went to Riverdale, I was like a, 10 or 11 years old. And that was the first time I had a New York bagel. For the first oh, yeah, time yeah. and like in Riverdale right so like a Jewish community and I was like this is amazing like what is this bagel and cream cheese I had never had a bagel and cream cheese because yeah. you know at that time like New York's um ethnic community like now I feel like New York is this place where you can you can have literally have contact with any part of the world and the Bronx even at any time oh for sure right for sure it's like walk a block and you know Arab food a block in another direction Mexican food at that time like your neighborhood had like the food of who lived there yeah you know the cuisine the traditional cuisine of whatever ethnic group like lived there so where we were there was like one restaurant 
that was actually Dominican. It was yeah. like the beginning of the Dominican migration. Sure. Um, and so they, but they made like food that was very similar to Puerto Rican food. So that was like our only takeout place. Yeah. Um, occasionally, of course, New York City pizza, like everybody, the dollar slice was still a the, thing. <laughs> there's, still, there's still one up here on Jerome Avenue. Um, it's one of one of the few surviving dollar slice places. But. Yeah, like nobody knows about the dollar slice. I'm like, we grew up on dollar. You always ask to pay. And I think for like $2, you could have pizza, a drink, and like candy afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that was, I think pizza is like, was definitely like a staple of childhood um, in the Bronx. And, and then like traditional Puerto Rican food. <clears throat> definitely, definitely. Um, and uh, what about, what what's some of the like more prominent kinds of music that you would hear either in your household or on the streets or in parks? Yeah, um, so growing up, it would be a combination of things. When my mom was cleaning the house, it was salsa. Sure. If my stepdad was home, his stepfather in Puerto Rico was a prominent singer of like boleros um, oh, in, yeah. in, in ensembles that were called trios. Okay, So sure. he would, and that would like torture me. I'd be like, the torture, <laughs> like these old men with their guitars. <laughs> Very much like a troubadour tradition, right? Yeah. So my stepdad would play the trios. Um, and then, you know, merengue was like, coming up in new york at that time and my mom was my mom was a dancer she loved to dance okay, yeah. so it was like salsa and merengue danceable stuff but my mom also grew up listening to soul music so i am like i mean my son now is like mom are we listening to this old tiny music it's you know it's 2021 and my son knows like all the classics from the 70s <laughs> and like the 60s <laughs> Um, because like soul was a important, important part of like my musical formation and like my yeah. upbringing. Um, my stepdad played plena, which is a Afro Puerto Rican traditional music. So, you know, we have plena. I learned bomba later in life, even though he played it, I didn't pay as much attention. Sure. So later in life, I came to hear and learn and actually play like bomba. But Plena was the thing. And he's from Ponce. My family is from the south of Puerto Rico, from Ponce. And so is my stepdad. And, okay, okay. you know, yeah. he's from a neighborhood called San Anton, mm. which is a very, like, it's, it's, a, it's a black Puerto Rican um, community where Plena is, like, the heart and soul of the people, right? So sure, he, sure. That, that was his musical upbringing. So that's, like, his heart. Yeah. Um, and then hip-hop and freestyle. So freestyle is interesting because... It was like considered the Latino music that was like the counterpoint to hip hop. Yeah. But I'm a hip hop head. Like, yeah. I have an older brother who's four years older than me who, you know, was a b boy, like used to do the linoleum on the street, and I was a tomboy. So, like, when he, my grand, I remember one day my grandfather took him shopping because he had to have Lee's. You yeah. know, this is when the lead jeans were in style and Pumas, suede Pumas specifically. They were white on navy blue, <laughs> suede <laughs> Pumas. And I went, oh my, I was just accompanying them. And, my, and I'm telling my grandfather, like, oh, I need the same leaves and the same Pumas. And my grandfather was like, no, like, you're a girl. And I was like, please, you know, I was like crying and carrying on. And so he bought me, like, reluctantly, he bought me the exact same outfit as my brother. <laughs> And I was really, really happy. But because I had, like, you know, and I think, again, some of this is gendered. I mean, hip-hop is not gendered. But, you know, it is a very masculine, yeah. testosterone <laughs> genre, especially in the 80s, right? Definitely, yeah. Um, and so my, I had an older brother who would, like, play loud music all day long as soon as he got home from school. And, and thanks to him. And also reggae. Oh, sure, because yeah. My brother lived in Parkchester. And near Parkchester, and you know this community. I live in Parkchester now. This community is—it's a blend of like, at that time it was Puerto Ricans, West Indians, um, a little bit of like Central Americans. They're after the the crisis, the conflicts in El Salvador. There started to be an influx of Salvadorians here. Um, some Mexicans, still some rem remnants of like Italian, Irish and Jewish folks um, closer to like Morris Park, right? But it's all walking distance. Um, so, you know, we had everything, but reggae specifically 
was really important in my youth because my brother would like play reggae all day long. His best friends were all West Indian. Yeah. yeah. And some Puerto Rican as well, but his really close friends were West Indian. So thanks to him, I got like another education. And, you know, again, classic reggae, you know, Barrington Levy. <laughs> that to me is the sound of the Bronx. It's like dance hall, it's hip hop. Um, and, you know, I remember when the NWA album came out, which is like terrible. It's all curses and women are trash in <laughs> yeah. the album, the first yeah. album. <laughs> and I'm not even gonna repeat, you know, any of the lyrics or song names, but I, would, I was fighting with my brother. How can you play that in this house? This is so offensive. But then like fast forward, then Brand Nubian came out and I memorized that entire album, you know? <laughs> uh, thanks to my brother, because he played it like seven times a day, the whole album in loop all day yeah. long, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all of that is the Bronx to me, you know? And then freestyle, as I was saying, it was like freestyle was like this danceable, you know, popular, urban, popular music that was all Latino. And, you know, a lot of musicologists have written about it. Like, it's what Latinos created when they felt excluded from certain spaces in hip-hop. But in my, you know, my experience, like, we helped to create hip-hop. Puerto Ricans specifically helped to create hip-hop. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. I just kind of, like, you know, I would take in all of it. Um, all of it. And then, you know, lastly, I think it's the sound of Afro-Cuban um, traditional drumming music in the Lukumi tradition, Yoruba. Yeah religious tradition, santeria, whatever you want to call it, because my family practiced that tradition. And so that is how we worship, is through the drum. Yeah. Um, so, you know, weekends, primarily, usually a Sunday, um, you would go, you know, to a tambor or bembe, and it was African drums. <laughs> yeah. Um, so all of that is the sound of the Bronx for me. Growing up now, where I live, is, you know, I'm a few blocks from Little Yemen. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. it's growing and, you know, and it's, and I'm, I'm experiencing like Arab youth culture because it's not just Yemeni, it's, you know, it's, it's Palestinian and, sure. and all like folks from all over the, you know, Noma folks, North African, Middle Eastern folks. And I'm hearing Arab, you know, hip hop. I've heard, I had actually friends who were like Palestinian hip hop artists back in the day, but in Palestine, now I'm listening to like Arabic pop music and hip hop in the streets of the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know i mean um, that, that, the area around park chester is one of my favorites in the bronx precisely because you know you experience exactly what you said you know on one street you can find like yemeni restaurants and you know store signs in in arabic and on the next you know the next block over suddenly there starts to be um you know signs of the the pretty large bangladeshi community and right exactly and then excellent like like oaxacan cuisine uh, that Takaria Tlashkali. Like, yep, that's yeah, right, yeah. on Starling Avenue. Yeah, I, I, I love that place. I love mm -hmm. that place. But um, but yeah, I think it's it's one of the many things that makes the Bronx uh, such a unique place. I mean, you, you can find similar things in Queens and parts of Brooklyn still, but, but yeah. I was actually going to say, I think Parkchester today is like the Queens of of the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. like every corner of the world, we have African community. My neighbors are from um, Guinea and up the street. I know some folks from the Gambia and there's a Ghanaian hub, like a Ghanaian cultural hub around the corner, you know, the yeah. restaurant and the grocery. Um, I mean, we have literally, we have everything. And I've even encountered, believe it or not, like European um, immigrants in Parkchester now, right? Yeah. As New York City is gentrified, people who would traditionally probably go to Brooklyn excuse me, or downtown or Queens, you know, um, who are priced out of those communities are moving to the Bronx. So they're like immigrant folk, middle-class professional immigrant folk who are like, oh, I actually can't afford to live over there, for but sure. I can afford it here. And Parkchester seems like the perfect place for that, you know, and given like the recent announcement around the Metro North steps that are coming, you have like more diversity. I feel like when I was growing up, this neighborhood was very much like a blue collar neighborhood. There's a lot of public workers, you know, bus drivers and, um, you know, teach public servants in general, right? So folks like bus drivers and transit workers and sanitation workers, but, and teachers, social workers. Um, and now it's like, it still is that, but there's just like, you know, the, the landscape is, um, I think, much more diverse, um, ethnically, racially, and also like, you know, in terms of class and, um, 
that experience. So it's really interesting. You know, I mean, uh, my favorite holiday in the Bronx today is Eid. Mm, um, yeah. in my neighborhood because it is what you said it's the bang, you know the people the bengali folks it's the arab folks it's the africans so you see like three different parts of the world out celebrating this beautiful holiday yeah. um and it's colorful and it's rich um and it's like every part of the world out in like full splendor you know every color you've ever imagined is like on the streets of parchester <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very beautiful. It's a very beautiful time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since since you you brought it up just a second ago, I think now might be a good time for you to talk more about um, uh, your experience of Santeria and and like African diasporic uh, expressions of religion in general. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> so a couple of things. My family is very interesting. It's a multi faith family. Um, in that my brother, my eldest brother, who I mentioned, Malik, um, when he was 16, he converted to Islam. Mm. So, you know, he's older than me. So he's like 48 years old. So over 30, 30 years um, as a practitioner of Sunni Islam, yeah. um, married an Egyptian woman in the Bronx, had Puerto Rican Egyptian babies in the Bronx, you know. Um, so that's one like strand of my family. Um, I think in that regard, my family is like very tolerant, <laughs> very open. Um, my family, my Panamanian family was Catholic, is Catholic primarily. So like we were all baptized and did our communions at St. Helena's, you know, Father Durvin, who baptized me, actually baptized my son. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Which was amazing. Um, so I, you know, I, I very much have kept like that part of the tradition. Um, you know, my thoughts on spirituality and religion are probably like a whole nother interview, but <laughs> I honor my ancestors who were, you know, who, who are Catholic um, by honoring their tradition. And so sure. we, we were Catholic and I'm still, I would say culturally Catholic more than like religious Catholic. Yeah. Um, on the Puerto Rican side, my grandmother um, was Catholic. And then as many people in Puerto Rico ended up converting to Pentecostalism. Mm. The interesting thing about that is that, you know, Espiritismo, which is like a spiritism, the tradition of mediumship, um, people in my Puerto Rican family, my grandmother, my great aunt, my people before them, their elders, um, were all spiritists. So this is like in our spiritual genetics, these are people who can see spirits, have dreams. Yeah. You know, um, my grandmother used to heal people with her hands, right? All of these traditions are rejected by Pentecostalism. Sure. So when my grandma becomes a Pentecostal, she, you know, now she's catching the Holy Spirit, <laughs> yeah. which is interesting. You know, I, I have a, a religion degree and I'm like, that's, you know, that's ancestor worship at yeah. its finest in a whole nother, it's an African retention in the Christian church, right? Definitely. Um, even though my grandma didn't see it that way. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, what I call spiritual genetics, like those spiritual genetics got passed down to my mom, got passed down to me. And so when my mom you know, as she grew up and she got older, my mom had already had the experience of of seeing spirits, of dreaming, of, you know, the spiritist experience, if you will. Espiritismo is a Puerto Rican thing. Like, other people around the world practice it, of course. But, like, Puerto Rico is not like Brazil or Cuba that has candomblé or santeria or voodoo. Like, in Haiti, we have more, like, folk traditions that are African in origin. Sure. Um, and I would say Espiritismo is ours. Um, so my mom, because she, you know, had that tradition and that consciousness, let's see, when she, in New York, she encountered Afro-Cubans and also Afro-Puerto Ricans who were active practitioners of Santeria. And so I think Espiritismo was like her gateway. Sure. Um, she also entered, like in terms of the actual religious practice, my Panamanian grandfather also had a very close-knit community with a, that it had a lot of Cubans in it because yeah. of the time during which he migrated. Sure. So Cubans are very much like a part of my community on both sides of my family. And my grandfather is actually the person who took my mom and my dad to their first uh, divination ceremony with a babalao. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. In the seventies. <laughs> so my grandfather begins practicing Santeria um, because of, again, his connection to the Cuban community my mom who already has a, a family background in espiritismo then gets introduced to santeria 
yeah. and begins practicing. But my mom ends up being the first one to get initiated oh, in the sure. 80s. Sure. Um, so we were raised, you know, all of my siblings, um, my mom's side went to Catholic school. <laughs> so we were raised, you know, I would say like in this interesting way that's like also very New York and probably doesn't happen anywhere else, but like we're raised as a multi-faith family. Um, and also like actively, like I'm a priestess of, you know, the Lukumi tradition as well. My son is initiated as a priest. Yeah. Um, it's now, we're now four generations in. Wow, yeah. Um, because of contact, our, our contact with like Cuban, Cuban folks who introduced us, right? Several generations ago. Wow. Um, and so I think that's a very New York thing, right? Like yep. um, the culture, like cultural cross pollination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the cultural cross pollination. And, you know, as people of African descent, you know, um, both of my families, um, Panamanian side and the Puerto Rican side are racially mixed families. So, you know, my dad's side, it's my grandmother was actually a refugee from Spain. So oh, that grandma that came to the Bronx, you know, Bronx River Avenue in 1961 was a Spanish political refugee. Wow. Yeah. Who eventually settled in Panama and married my Panamanian grandfather. Wow. So, and, so I'm sure she, she was playing Franco then, huh? She actually survived the Franco concentration camp. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Um, and so she and her parents fled Spain. And they were, they were, if I'm not um, mistaken, they were interned in southern France. Yeah. In a concentration camp. Um, they, they left Spain. And my grandmother was a bit essentially going on to study nursing. Like she decided that she wanted to become a nurse. And so she, they stopped in almost every country that had a dictator. I'm, I'm going to ruin the chronology, but, you know, my grandmother lived in the Dominican Republic. Oh, yeah. She lived in Cuba. And, like, each time they would settle on another island, a new dictator. You know, it's, it's Batista. It's Trujillo. Right? And so every time a new dictator would take shit, would, would take power, yeah. my great-grandparents would move them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were kind of just high island hopping for a minute. <laughs> Wow. And eventually settled in Panama. Yeah. But my grandmother decided to stay behind in Cuba to finish her nursing education. Um, she was a nurse midwife. And, you know, in Panama, my great grandparents had like a, a boarding house for Spanish refugees. Sure. Um, my great grandfather was an anarchist. Um, yeah. You know, he was an anti Franco activist, <laughs> which is how you eventually get my dad, I think, um, and the rest of us. Yeah. I think it's like it's in our blood. <laughs> yeah, multi-generational. Wow. I mean it's yeah. 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 And so that's how my dad, you know, ends up being Panamanian. My grandma's a Spanish, she's a Catalan, she was from Barcelona. She was actually born in Badalona, which is like 20 minutes outside of Barcelona. Um, and my grandfather's an indigenous, you know, Panamanian man, um, you know, mestizo man, but in a clearly indigenous man, invisibly indigenous man. Um and so then you get my dad, you know? Yeah. Um, and then on the Puerto Rican side, you know, my family is also mixed in, but for generations, like my, both of my grandparents have a black parent and a, a European parent and variable. Like one of my great grandmothers is Corsican. I learned actually last year. Yeah. Um, she's a brown skinned Mediterranean looking woman. She's from Corsica. Her family was from Corsica. And if you, if you look at that connection in Puerto Rico, you know, Corsican topography is like very similar to Puerto Rican topography. And yeah, yeah. So there are all these crazy connections. Um, but we're like, I'm a person of mixed African, indigenous, you know, and European descent, not because of like the romantic, you know, there's this romantic construction of race where all Latinos are mixed <laughs> and with the, the blends of all the races. It's like, that's actually not so for all sure. Latino people. Absolutely. Um, there are people who are unambiguously black, unambiguously indigenous, unambiguously white, and then there are mixed people. And I happen to be one of those. Yeah. Um, but that said, you know, I say all of that to say that in addition to like the, the cultural and racial dynamics of that, is that they're, that they're also religious sure. um, and spiritual dynamics of that, right? Because all of those tr traditions and bloodlines kind of, um, produce what I call spiritual genetics. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, in the, my Puerto Rican family, you have this African, you know, our African exp or expression of our Africanness comes through Espiritismo. Yeah. Um, you know, my mom always tells me about her uncle 
who she remembers dressed in white every single day in Puerto Rico, you know, um, and and nobody she didn't know why she didn't even know to ask why right yeah. but like learn later in life was connecting the dots um and so we were raised in this african tradition and you know it's that actually being raised as you know a lukumi practitioner has been um for me like the the basis and the seed of connections with lots of other i mean outside of the fact that my parents raised me politically to always like ally with oppressed people in New York City specifically with black people, uh, black American people, because there are black Puerto Ricans and black Panamanians and black lots of things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, specifically yeah. to have political alliances with the African American community, other Caribbean people, other Latin American people, other quote unquote at that time third world people, right? People sure, of the global sure. south. Sure. Um that's part of my political formation. I think like ha being part of an African religious community is yet like a deepening of that it's like another um it's another link right absolutely it's another link um so now you know that community is like i remember in the 80s when we practiced my mom you know being in her um initiation year where we dress in white for a year and seven days and having pentecostal people on the street yell like devil worshiper you know <clears throat> my grandmother disowned her yeah my pentecostal grandmother disowned her even though she was a spirit medium. Sure, sure. Even though she was still catching the Holy Ghost at church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> calling it by a different name, but. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we suffered a lot of discrimination actually because of it. And it was something that at that time in the 80s was still something you didn't really talk about outside of the community. Yeah. Whereas now in the age of social media and because like all these pop figures are sort of, um, you know, have been exposed to it so like beyonce you know everyone oh beyonce is a child of Oshun, and she wore yellow in the lemonade video you know um this is like what people understand about our tradition at this point um there's a different consciousness about it and i would say it's almost becoming commodified yeah yeah definitely. um and monetized in ways that we would never ever think to do um but it's a new day right it's a new day and so it's really interesting time i think within this religious community as we think about like what are the parameters of, of practice like what are the hard lines between a sacred space and um secular space because yeah. so many people who are not raised in the tradition i you know i the tradition is open to whoever wants to adopt it and i do think that when folks convert which my family did <laughs> yeah, yeah but i think that when folks i was raised in it so i have a slightly different perspective i think that when folks convert they don't it takes them a while to kind of um understand that like it is actually not just a religion it's also a world view definitely um it's a way of life because it's a nature-based practice so you know our sacred um shrines if you will are are the trees and the ocean <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. the river um the sky right and and it takes a while to internalize that right um another interesting fact about simpson street though is that my mom was probably the first person on that block to be initiated but after my mom a bunch of the moms got initiated oh sure um, so that that neighborhood and that community and to this day i'm so connected with those folks like our community has a lot of um santeria practitioners oh wow a lot a lot a lot um and people have moved away but i still kind of know where everyone is and their children have been initiated as well yeah. And and not just the Latino folks. So it's African Americans, Puerto Ricans primarily, um, who are all initiates of this tradition. And I very much can remember when none of us were. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but it was one of the things that somehow bound our community. It was one of the things that ended up kind of trickling out and and becoming like a staple cultural um practice in our neighborhood, which is really interesting because you don't usually like when I, I I've traveled a bunch and worked a bunch in Cuba. And that's like a normal thing there, you know, everyone's initiated and you go on, there are neighborhoods that are known for religious practice. And um, I find it interesting that like in New York, you know, there's like a literally a block. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Where we could, I can tell you, even if you, you know, even if they're not publicly known, there are a whole bunch of Santeros on that block. It, it, um, it sounds like um, I need to do oral histories with, uh, uh, with, you know, as many people as possible. Uh, um, that you know that are Santeros or Santeras from that block. Um, 
I think that'd be really a tremendous addition to this, um, this project. Yeah, there are a bunch. And, you know, I think that's the other interesting thing about growing up, you know, Lukumi, for lack of a better word. There's actually a book called Growing Up Lukumi. But yeah, Growing Up Lukumi in the Bronx is that, you know, there's also, there's an underground economy, right? Like an underground um, infrastructure, more than economy, there's an underground infrastructure that exists. So it's the houses, like one of the main houses when I was growing up was on Jessup Avenue. Mm. that it doesn't exist anymore but all of I remember a lot of ceremonies taking place on Jessup Avenue and that would be the place that we would go for drummings and sure. you know later it was a uh, Commonwealth Avenue 630 Commonwealth Avenue was another religious place you know these are called Casas de Santo because people rent them out for a week yeah. and do their ceremonies and have their drummings there um and and increasingly it's really interesting and I think it's you know in part due to COVID um but it's also in part due to like the sort of changing of the guard in terms of generations and where we are physically in the world at this time yeah a lot of the houses and there were many you know they're up some up by pelham parkway um on mickle avenue like there are a bunch yeah but increasingly there are less and less and less oh, you know yeah, I see. and a lot of the folks it has a lot to do with um you know, Puerto Rican, uh, in, in the Bronx, I think the Ocha community, what we call the Ocha community, Lukumi community, is mostly Puerto Rican and uh, Cuban sure. and African-American. Um, Brooklyn is heavily African-American and Afro-Caribbean. Um, a lot of, the, as we know, right, Puerto Ricans are leaving New York in large numbers to Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the people who were kind of main, whose homes were mainstays of the community and kind of offered this service of like La Casa de Santo that you would rent out have left. And they're like in Tampa, they're in Miami, some are in Orlando, sure. um, but they're mostly in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then a bunch, you know, there are some scattered places in, you know, New England. Interestingly, there are folks that I know of in Rhode Island and Connecticut, excuse me, um, Massachusetts, um, upstate New York. Yeah. Um, Poughkeepsie, interesting that all these, you know, places that have different stories that like the nucleus is the Bronx, but where folks have migrated either north or south um, in search of home, yeah. right? They, they outgrew apartment life um, to be connected to family. Definitely. Um, and a lot of it is about, like, a lot of that is about the story of Puerto Rican specifically migration. Sure. Because um, the Bronx is sort of you know, obviously, Cuba, it's a Cuban, Afro-Cubans are who preserved it. Africans in Cuba are who gave us this tradition. Um, but because of, again, cultural cross-pollination, the, the religious community in the Bronx has been largely like Puerto Rican and Cuban. And um, there are like lots of pioneers, if you will, um, in the Bronx who are of Puerto Rican ancestry, um, who are responsible for the preservation and also the dissemination um of the tradition here sure um are there are there any particularly um significant sites for your spiritual practice around the bronx other than the um <laughs> santos that you've already mentioned you know no because one of the things about so i lived in brazil for some time when you go to brazil and you experience <clears throat> and have contact with the uh the yoruba religious communities there you know they they do their religious practices are on tejeros which are physical masses of land um where people for generations for hundreds of years have been coming to the same location to yeah. practice together um and you know people inherit the post of leader of that community they're maroon communities right yeah yeah in the Cuban context, one of the, the distinguishing features is that the tradition was urbanized. And it's why our shrines are smaller sure. um, and they're designed almost for, for the home, yeah. right? Um, it's like in Brazil, I remember going, it's like, oh, well, walk down the way and there's a big tree there and at that tree is the shrine for so-and-so. And if you walk the other way, there's a yeah. hut and that hut is the shrine for so-and-so. You know, in New York, it's like, Typically, you have a canastillero, or in Cuba as well, you have a canastillero, which is a piece of furniture um, that in, I believe, the 20s and 30s, when Afro-Cuban religion was banned in Cuba, yeah. uh, it was a, a China a China closet, like a buffet, sure. right? And with doors. And so you would put your orishas in there and close the doors. And yeah. that's the canastillero. And to this day, that tradition persists where people are like, 
yeah. you know, you, you get initiated, you have a canastiero, that's where your orishas live. Yeah. Not everyone has the one, you know, not everyone uses doors anymore because we don't have to hide anything. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Most of our shrines are in our homes. Um, and then, you know, because it's a nature-based religion, <clears throat> anywhere you go on the planet where elements of nature exist can potentially be religious sites, right? Because there are places where you can pray, there are places where you can make offerings. Um, so some, the Bronx River, I will say. I was going to ask about the Bronx <laughs> Yeah. The Bronx River is an important place um, because the river is very important to many of our ceremonies. Absolutely, yeah. And it's a common place to offer Orchard Beach and City Island because of the ocean. Sure. Um, but the Bronx River, you know, there are some details I can't really disclose, but the Bronx River is a place where many, 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 many generations of Santeros in New York City and in the Bronx um, have gone for sacred ceremonies. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's also right near the Bronx River. It's one of one one place where only only like a handful of indigenous petroglyphs was found. It, it was a turtle, maybe back in like the seventies, I think, is when it was found. But it was carved on like a boulder near the Bronx River. I think it's in it's you know somewhere. Maybe in, I hope it's not in storage, but it's probably in storage in the Bronx but they're in the botanical gardens now somewhere but um but yeah you know it's such a site that has had you know clearly a, a very profound significance to the the people who lived here before Europeans uh killed them and and drove them out as well so there's yeah I think such a profound um uh spiritual connection with the Bronx River so um I love, I mean, I live, um, I live in Parkchester and, you know, the Bronx River is a short walk away. The Bronx River Art Center yeah. um, is a short walk away and they've done this revitalization of the waterfront and created a, a greenway and a bicycle path. And, you know, um, there's a project that the Bronx River, I forget what it's called, but there's a Bronx River project where they, you know, they canoe and kayak up and down the river and they do conservation work and cleaning work. I think it's so important. I think you know, beyond even it's like religious and sacred nature, right? For so many of us, it's like, it's sacred because the Bronx is a really dense borough, Yeah. you know? Um, and so it's like, wow, like there's water flowing through here, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And waterfalls, like. It's and waterfalls, exactly. It, yeah. And you, people don't even imagine, you know? And sometimes we'll, we'll like do the local thing now that the Greenway is close by, but you know, there, we'll just drive up you know you go 15 20 minutes north and you know there are green spaces and parks that just like follow the river's path and you know that's like my dream for the Bronx one day right it was like imagine if we gave that much green space <laughs> to the people of the Bronx I think about all the time you know the fountain in Parkchester which has been there forever was part of the original design of the community I think it's a beautiful design feature because you know, Parkchester was designed as like this self-sufficient community, yeah. right? And so there was the housing, but then all of the businesses you could put, you could literally stay in Parkchester and not have to go anywhere for anything else. Yeah. But the, the, the fountain and the plaza as a feature is something that is so common, excuse me, in like all of the countries of, of origin of the people who live here now. Yeah. So like on any given day, you go to that fountain, even in the winter, even when it's cold, and it's elders like sitting around the fountain and it's children playing around the fountain and it's families, you know, and I, I, it's like, it's just like a reminder, you know, of how we need like physical space and design, right? We need urban design that like fosters connection, um, but also how we create it when we don't have it. <laughs> Definitely. You know? Um. Are there any specific, uh, is there a specific Orisha or Orishas that you have um, a strong devotion to or that you're um, uh, going yeah. to in other ways? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm a priestess of Obatala. Okay. Obatala is the, um, he's sort of considered the, um, the father of all the Orishas, the head. He's a sky god. He is the Orisha of wisdom. He's the Orisha of creation. He's responsible for molding the human body. Um, Arisha associated with clarity, with, um, you know, the brain, the mind, the head, the consciousness also. Um, his color is white. He's the Arisha of purity. Um, so that's my tutelary Arisha. That is who I'm consecrated to. Sure. 
Um, and also like all of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole pantheon, I love them all. We, in our tradition, you know, you get a mother and a father. So because I'm consecrated to a male Orisha, my mother is Oshun, with the goddess of the river, um, one of the rivering goddesses, um, who people are like, the goddess of love. She's the goddess of love, but she's also the goddess of community, connection, yeah. um, sweetness. You know, she owns the blood, so therefore family and, um, you know, connection that is cultivated through blood. Yeah. Um, joy. She's the Orisha of joy. Um, my mother is a piece of Yemaya which is the, the owner of the oceans and also like the universal mother, you know, the owner, of, the sort of Orisha of maternity. Um, <clears throat> my son is a piece of Shango, uh, the Orisha uh, okay. yeah, of, yeah. of thunder and lightning, but also the drum and the dance. He's really like a strategist. He's a, you know, he was a deified king in, in Yoruba land. Um, so he is a great king. He's a strategist. He's a warrior. He's um, the, what we say is the king of our religion because he's the one that everyone kind of knows. Even if they don't practice Santeria in the Latino community, everybody knows Chango. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, he's a popular dude, you know. Um, so, I mean, they're all very, I think the beauty of, of being in an African religious tradition is that our cosmology um is like rooted in an awareness of the interconnection between and the interdependence of Definitely. all of these essences right it's nature but it's also you know each arisha is connected to um, a feature of the natural world a place in the natural world but they're also responsible for a domain of the human experience <laughs> uh, right yeah, yeah. um and and you need all of them all like all of the time working perhaps in different configurations sure. um in different times in your life but you actually need all of them and i think in that regard you know we know these traditions african traditions and indigenous uh, traditions often the cosmology you know you have these anthropomorphic figures these like deities if you will or spirits that I, you know, look like humans, but aren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, in our tradition, we have these, oh, the Orisha, you know, are role models, right? They're, or models, they're sure. archetypes. They're archetypes of our human experience. And you, you actually really do need all of them. Yeah. Um, you just need different ones at different times um, or in different combinations. And so I think, you know, thinking through, Thinking through like where I am now, you know, when I was a little girl, I was like, damn, like they're calling my mom a devil worshiper. You know, um, I used to, I used to get really anxious if I saw people in a state of spirit possession. Yeah. Um, Cause I didn't understand. I would also get really nervous when I went to my grandmother's church and people caught sure. the Holy ghost, like anything where the body seemed to be doing things <laughs> other than what I was accustomed to. Yeah. Um, would, would cause anxiety, right? And I'd be like, oh, I don't want to be here anymore, you know? Take me home. Um, my son doesn't have that experience because I guess I've, you know, socialized and conditioned him to a different consciousness about what it all means. But even like how I see it now, um, you know, these traditions are traditions of resistance sure. and um, of resilience. They have helped us to cultivate resilience through, through time for generations since before enslavement and through yeah. enslavement. Um, in, in the case of Lukumi, Yoruba, you know, Afro-Cuban Yoruba tradition, many of the um, elder activists who, you know, from the Black Power Movement and the Young Lords adopted these traditions um, yeah. as part of their, like, political resistance and as, as a form of cultural resistance, you know, at that time. Um, I think that for us, you know, one of the, the things growing up in New York City is that it's like an ancient, um, <laughs> it's like a seed that was planted a very long time ago, but that binds many of the people that are here on this land at this time, you know, so again, people of the African diaspora who, whose people were taken to different lands and had kind of come, have, have met, we, we've met each other again. <laughs> yeah. Um, we reunited, if you will. Um, in the crossroads of the world, right? Which is New York. I mean, yeah. yeah. And I and I think that's a really that's a really beautiful thing. It is, yeah. And I mean, you know, just I I think sometimes people don't realize just 
pe people who might not be as familiar with uh, the various traditions of African uh, diasporic uh, religion, they might not realize just how central of a role that these played in all of the slave revolts from like the 16th century onward until uh, uh, until slavery, at least in name, was abolished in the various, um, uh, you know, various uh, slaveholding countries. But like in Haiti, um, the Haitian Revolution was basically started by uh, um, by a priestess or by a priest having a um, vision, and uh, it, it's it's just an amazing absolutely uh, history. and an offering, right? A Bwakaiman, like. This yeah. is, you know, I actually um, recently I've taken an interest in, I have a good friend who's a choreographer in Brooklyn um, who has been doing a lot of work around um, Southern Black American ring shouts and ring shouting. And which I think is just like, just a beautiful tradition um, preserved by very few today. I think there's like, there are some ring shouters in Georgia and some from the Gullah Islands. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, contemporary interpreters. But one of the things that, as I was studying, I've been reading a lot about ring shouts and I'm actually, um, <laughs> I'm curating a panel on, on African media, on mediumship in, oh, sure. in, a, in various um, African traditions. And um, as I'm reading, you know, and, and learning that, because I, I witnessed one, right, a performance of one where someone uh, became possessed. Yeah. And so I immediately reached out to the um, choreographer and I was like, can I ask you a question? I was like, that wasn't a performance. <laughs> like, that, that person was, was channeling some, you know, a, a spirit, an ancestor. Um, and how do you manage that in a performance yeah. space, right? Yeah. And so we got in, we, I learned about like the tradition of the church nurses um, who, who specifically tend people who are, um, you know, catching the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wait, now I'm like, did my grandmother's church have that? Like, <laughs> I want to be surprised. Yeah, like, I want to know, right? So, yeah. but it just like reminded me of the universality, like that in all of these traditions, even when they aren't formal religions, sure. right? In these traditions that are African uh, traditions, fundamentally, you know, the, the centrality of ancestor worship, the centrality of the circle, right? Because they all use circles in, in their spiritual practice and embodiment. Yeah. Um, the, the, the fact that mediumship was a staple of life, yeah. right? In our, in our context, um, you know, as I said, like devil worshiper, oh my God, it's like every, anything, as we know, excuse me, in our society and in, in any society that's like rooted in white supremacy, right? Anything yeah. black, anything African, anything outside of the Western canon is demonized, it's yeah. marginalized, et cetera. But I think like, what the studying the ring shots reminded me was like, <clears throat> which I knew, like, but it, I needed the reminder was like, you know, actually like this, even European, I worked in Scotland for several years, like on and off as a consultant and, you know, looking at like traditional Scottish um, customs and spiritual customs. Um, I, I, I did a presentation once at like the, um, their version of the Museum of Natural History mm. and learned that that was like an old, an ancient, um, site um for sacrifice you know but specifically sacrifice to like the fire god and sure. you know and that to this day there are people who practice the traditional ways that come from all across scotland to honor the fire god you know this one time a year <laughs> right uh, yeah, so yeah. this is like our universal human instinct it doesn't actually matter like what part of the world you're from in asia europe africa the indigenous world like all of our people across humanity have done these things for as long as we've been on the planet and yeah. in existence, right? And so, you know, thinking about how being in a, in a city and in a community, the Bronx, where all of these different traditions are like come together or have the opportunity to interact with one another and like mirror one another, um, it's just like, it, it to me it's like it helps to I, like I guess I'm experiencing it as like an awakening of sorts in that yeah. different people are awakening <laughs> to their ancestral practices their ancestral consciousness but through their connection and because of their connection and witnessing of each other yeah um and I think that's a beautiful thing like you know, the thing about, I think the Bronx is the most underrated borough. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And as long as it keeps real estate developers out and, and, and other things, then, then 
I don't mind that aspect that if it's if it's underrated, but it definitely doesn't get nearly enough love as as it should. No, and it's so rich. It's such a rich. It's such a rich, rich, rich place. You know, um, yeah. in so many in so many ways, it's it's a rich place. Um, but we're underrated, and and I don't think I actually do think that gentrification is is hitting us already, and will hit us harder in the near future. Definitely. Um, which is why your your project is so important because the Bronx that I grew up in is certainly not the Bronx that I live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and nothing is static, right? We know yeah, that. Yeah. Um, we know that. But it's it's interesting. It's like if this isn't documented, sort of, we will lose some very rich history. I was thinking about you were talking about um, when I was like when you were young. What did you like to do? It's not so much of what I would like to do, but it made me think about a feature of my community. Yeah. Um that doesn't exist anymore is that when I was growing up around the corner on 163rd, there was a, a Jewish clothier, mm. right? And when during that era, during the hip hop era, you know, I remember even the place where I went with my brother um, to buy the leaves on the Pumas, my grandpa, like it was another Jewish clothier. Yeah. Um, and so, I, it, you know, it makes me think that like that time in the Bronx, there was still a lot of, because the communities were still in transition, whether we're talking about the East Bronx or the South Bronx, there were still like folks that today would typically not be in community with one another, in community yeah. with one another. So like, so the, the, the clothier on 163rd, his name was Chucky. A lot of the kids call him the Jewman, but everybody knew his name was Chucky. I called him yeah. Chucky, <laughs> you know? And Chucky was like part of the community. And Chucky had all the latest fashion, sneakers and coats were his specialty. Yeah. And, you know, and he also like had relationships in the community, right? So sure. it's also like, I'm thinking about the traditional small business, right? And like moms being like, damn, I want to buy this coat for my kid. I remember when sheepskin coats were in style and they were really, really expensive. And I remember, cause he would haggle on the street. So <laughs> you would see people and the coats would hang on the street from the front of the building. Yeah. Um, and he would haggle and you would see be like, oh, $600, that's too much. And he'd be like, all right, well, give me 200 and come back in a week and bring me a hundred more. And then I'll let you take the coat, but you got to promise you're going to come back with the other 300 <laughs> and kids would haggle with him and kids would save their money and go to him or get the money from their parent and come haggle with him. And like, even stuff like that is lost. Right. As like yeah. all of the businesses in the borough are like these corporate chains, Definitely. you know, where's Chucky, you know, where's the Chucky, where's the guy who haggle or let you put, put the layaway or, you know, negotiate with your kid for their favorite sneaker. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, th I, those are things that I think are really interesting to look back on. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like um, sometimes that aspect of, uh, uh, of how the Bronx has changed over the decades gets, uh, gets lost because, you know, it's, it's easy to think of how housing has changed tremendously because of uh, um, gentrification and, you know, all kinds of real estate development schemes. Um, but I think people sometimes forget that a lot of the old, older small business, um, small businesses might have like owned that one particular building that they were in. And so they didn't have a landlord coming along and suddenly raising the rent by, um, you know, $10,000 a month uh, um, uh, the next year. Um, but a lot of that isn't possible anymore because fewer and fewer people own all mm -hmm. of the, all of the property. Um, so, so yeah, but uh that that's a, that's a great that's a great story um so, <laughs> um and one one more question about um your your religious practice before we move on to other things if that's if that's all right with you um right. what are some of the most meaningful um rituals or traditions in your religious practice at least ones that you could share with um yeah it's um, I think so, you know, our African, this particular um, African tradition has primary pillars, right? And they are divination, um, uh, possession, right? Not everyone can be possessed, but that is one, one direct form of communication with God, right? <laughs> and the Aretas. Um, the tradition of drumming and dancing as like embodied prayer, yeah. right? We pray by singing and dancing. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And then like the tradition of offerings, right? Offerings, whether they are fruits or cooked foods that we make special sacred foods that are made for the Orisha or other sacrifices. Um, you know, all of those are like, I would say the most integral parts of our, of our practice, right? If you will. And I think, you know, in our tradition, we don't have, um, like a holiday, like a Christmas, for example, or a Passover or Eid. Um, our holy days are the days of typically the days in which an, an initiate's consecration anniversary um, colloquially called the Ocha birthday, <laughs> right? The day that you are reborn as an yep. initiate, as a priest, um, and the, and the um, consecration anniversaries of your elders. Sure. So, because it, you know, everything is transmitted in relationship with and through the relationships with elders and on down, right? Yeah. Um, so those holy days are like, are many actually, right? If you're yeah. connected to a family and a community because Every like in my household, it's just my son and I, but we're both priests. So there are at least two days a year that there is a, a celebration in my home. Definitely. Excuse me. And then all of the celebration days and consecration anniversaries of our elders and of our siblings, our religious. I mean, that's you know one of the features of um, Afro-Cuban and African religion. I think in the, the ones with initiation traditions like Podu and Candomblé and Santeria and others, you know, Shango Baptist in Trinidad, right? Is that your religious community are you like you have a religious family yeah. as well there's a new lineage that is born when you're initiated right and the sure. the people who oversee your initiation your consecration become your spiritual like godparents in catholicism the people who baptize you right and and those people are your family yeah um so i think like the you know and, he, and, you know, it's like a big family when your cousins and your siblings and your aunts and your uncles and your grandparents have a birthday, everyone celebrates, right? Um, it's that way in, in our tradition. And those are our holy days. Um, ceremonial days are our holy days as well. Sure. Um, and all of, you know, I think one of the, <clears throat> the, the beautiful parts about it, in addition to the celebration, which is usually a sharing of food, like you must always feed the people. Yeah. That's an important feature. Um, obviously, there's prayer and offerings that are made to the Orishas. Um, but there's also, you know, I think those um, celebrations are the basis of um, mutual aid, right? Sure, it's sure. like these traditions were preserved through mutual aid societies during enslavement. And, and the tradition of mutual aid, I think, carries on. Um, it's endured. Um, and so, you know, it's not just that you're preparing the feast, but like your family might be helping you to prepare the feast, right? People yeah, are cooking yeah. together. They're preparing offerings together they're eating together everyone has to take food home one of the um features of of the um the anniversary the ocha birthday is that you as an offering the priest who is celebrating must have um a, a part of the uh, shrine is um a feast of fruit that are sacred to that orisha Sure. And everyone who comes to your home must take home um, a basket of fruit. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, and, and that's a, like a super important, like very small detail, but not small at all. It's like you're not only are you feeding folks, but you're sharing like the sacred energies, right? Yeah. Of that Orisha with anyone. And it doesn't matter if they're initiates, non-initiates. It could be a friend that came through, you know, but everyone leaves with this gift of fruit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are certain offerings that are made, candles and plates and coconuts and things. and all of these things are symbolic and they represent, you know, um, the prayer for abundance and food for, the, you know, the celebrant, but also for the community, you know, the offering of light so that people's paths will be illuminated and clear. Um, and then coconut representing one form of divination that we may always have communication with the divine realm, you know, and prayers are also for the entire community. Um, and I think, I think that's really beautiful. And then initiations are, while they are um, <clears throat> done in private and only, you know, initiates can attend, there is one day during the seven-day initiation that is public. Mm. And it's the day where the Iyawo, which is the new initiate, is presented to the community. And usually there's a, you know, a drumming ceremony. Um, there's ceremonial clothing that they wear representing their Orisha. 
Um, and that's a big old celebration as well. And it's a way to, again, to introduce to the world, the rebirth, the reborn person. Yeah. Um, so those are our holy days and they're not like on anybody's calendar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, um, you just have to remember yeah. that. And I'm, um, yeah. I, I, for folks that, you know, um, come from uh, families that still kind of follow the, you know, a lot of people think Santeria is syn syncretic, right? And like, oh, the Catholic saints and the Orishas. Not necessarily so. However, um, one tradition that has endured in some households is that the Saint Day associate, the Catholic Saint Day associated with an Orisha in the times of enslavement might still be considered the feast day for that Orisha. So like December 4th is the day of St. Barbara, which some people, you know, associate with Chango. So people might celebrate Chango on that day. Sure. Not everyone does it, um, but those would be probably the most universal days. Um, and again, in the end, the celebration is the same. It's always, you know, an altar that is built in the home, yeah. food offerings, possibly music drumming. Not everyone drums at every celebration. Um, but more than anything, it's community building, it's sharing of abundance and food and our blessings, whatever they are, um, for all generations, you know, yeah. like all the generations come together. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, like, like you were saying, it's, it's, it's not some, it's not just like a kind of um religion in the way that some people think of religion as something you know that that someone might do on sunday or holy days or this or that it's a whole kind of view of the world that um uh, uh that's delivered in the midst of these rituals um and it's a really beautiful view of the world too um yeah absolutely um may i may i ask for like a two minute break Sure. I just want to check on my son and I will return. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I'm just going to pause it and then I'll start it back whenever you return. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, you already mentioned a little bit about the Spence School, but would you like to share more about your experience there? Sure. Um, so as I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I went to Spence in the seventh grade. I was there from seventh to twelfth grade. Um, at the time, I mean, Spence is still relatively small, but, you know, it's a K through 12 prep school, independent school. At the time, my graduating class was 36 girls, wow. <laughs> wow. right? Which I, now the classes are, I think, about double the size. Um, but, you know, coming from a public school where you're like, your classroom is 35 kids yeah. <laughs> versus like the whole grade is 36 girls. Um, that was a huge shift. Um, my, at the time, my stepdad had, I told you, he worked at Lincoln. He had gone to working at Metropolitan Hospital in East Harlem. Ah, uh, okay. So okay. I was still really lucky because I got to get driven to school every day. So I was like driven for some time. And then, you know, Spence was the first time I took the subway a long distance. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, um, my particular class, which was the class of 94, had historically i think the largest ever and the largest since percentage of girls of color wow you know, spence is like one of the most elite educational institutions in the country and so yeah. you know by chance i ended up there in the class with the largest number of girls of color um black and latina girls and yeah. you know a few asian girls we were almost i believe half of the class Wow, wow. Which is huge. I mean, 36 girls, but nonetheless, it was like a lot of us. Yeah. Um, we were almost half. And, you know, um, first I'll say that I'm deeply grateful for the experience um, in that I got, it, it was a rigorous education. It was a college, you know, it's a college preparatory school. The attention that that school and those types of schools have to really like, a holistic education that cultivates all of your potential interests and really like gives you a foundation um, across all disciplines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, is something that I'm deeply grateful for. It, it that you know completely, I think like opened up my my consciousness to like new possibilities, right? That I wouldn't have imagined if having worked in public schools in New York City for over 20 years in different capacities. I'm very clear like you typically do not get in a New York City public school. Yeah. Um, and I think, honestly, it was one of the driving forces behind w like why I eventually entered into doing education equity work and even like social justice work in general, because, you know, 
fundamentally, I believe every child deserves that level of education. Absolutely. Yeah. Period. Like you shouldn't have to pay seventy thousand dollars a year <laughs> now, like fifty, sixty, yeah. forty. Back yeah. then it was probably twenty five, twenty six thousand dollars a year. Um to have. Um, it was my first time. So having grown up in the Bronx, obviously I mentioned my aunt's best friend was like this Italian woman and her whole family was like very close to our family. And we have family friends who are Jewish. And my dad had, you know, friends who were allies from the movement who were Jewish mostly, but also like other types of white folks. I remember Mr. Andy in the South Bronx Clean Air Coalition who's Irish, you yeah. know, um, I grew up with ethnic, quote unquote, ethnic whites, right? Yeah. Who were part of my community and, and in and some cases close to my family. Sure. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't um, disoriented by being around, quote unquote, white people, right? Yeah. What I was disoriented by initially and which was a, a thing, like that experience is also, I think, part of the, that experience kind of took my racial consciousness to like another level because yeah. we were talking not about being with white people but we're being with white wealth yeah yeah, right? yeah yeah um white wealth and i think certainly i had witnessed like racism in the in the 1980s and 90s you know morris park is like a neighboring neighborhood from parkchester yeah i remember when my brother couldn't cross the bridge on east tremont avenue and white plains road which yeah. is like the bridge that takes you from Park to Morris Park, which is not actually now takes you to Little Yemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you couldn't cross that bridge because on the other side of that bridge were Albanians who were also new immigrants at the time coming from conflicts in Eastern Europe, yeah. but who were violent and racist. And so if yeah. anybody my shade or darker was on the other side of that bridge, it meant a, it meant a physical beatdown. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So black and brown boys in particular again, because boys had more freedom to move, right? Yeah. They wouldn't go over that bridge, or if they did, they would go over it ready to fight if necessary. Yeah. Right, there was like racial tension and there were racial lines. I had experienced, of course, Italians, like being racist in a lot of the neighborhoods my family came to, they were the first Puerto Ricans or Latinos, in my case of my dad, Panamanians on the block. Yeah. Um, you know, they each rented from a Puerto Rican family, but that was the only Puerto Rican family. I think my dad said there were two Puerto Rican families on his block and one black family. Wow, yeah. Everyone else was Italian and Irish, and in my mom's case, Italian and Jewish. Um, so whatever, I understood racial tension, racial conflict. Um, I also understood solidarity and allyship, right? Um, going to Spenso was like, the 1%, <laughs> exposure to the 1%. Definitely. Um, and some of the things that we experienced upon arrival were like, you know, I remember somebody being like, oh, you're Puerto Rican, does your dad carry a knife? Or, you know, you have a, one of my friends who was an upper middle class black woman who was African American and Jamaican. Her father was a business owner. He, he was a seafood uh, wholesaler for City Island, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And he lived up in the, the suburbs at the time in Mount Vernon, big, beautiful house, drove a Jaguar. And he would drive us to the school dances and we would arrive at the school dances in the beautiful silver Jaguar because he had one. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember somebody being like, oh, is your dad a drug dealer? Cause he's Jamaican and he drives a Jaguar, you know? So it was kind of, I mean, people call those microaggressions today. I think they're totally macro and- Oh, me too. <laughs> explicit and absurd. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like, I think our initial, the first few years there were a lot of that. Yeah. Not from everyone, obviously. Sure, sure. Um, but, you know, it was a lot of navigating that. It was a lot of, you know, um, just the experience of commuting. I told you I had a Bronx crew. Yeah. Um, we took the six train together from 86th six. Street <laughs> on up, you know, um, we, would, we would split at 125th and the, you know, the uptown Fordham Road would go to the Ford train and then Parkchester and Co-op City would stay on the six train. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting things that happened and it's the beginning of what you now see as like the diversity and equity and inclusion, like DEI initiatives that are happening across the independent schools now. Yeah. Is that we had, we did have some very progressive educators and I specifically remember I had a queer Jewish woman history teacher who, in the time that I was there, particularly in high school, 
she was like, okay, well, we have these girls and we have a lot of work to do. We need to make this curriculum more inclusive. So I took my first African-American studies class in high school, thanks to her. Oh, wow. My first woman's studies class. Yeah. I had another uh, history teacher who was an Asia specialist. So I took my first history of India, history of China. Um, I took a Native American studies class, thanks to, you know, Miss Jewett, who was the, the queer woman teacher, queer Jewish woman um, teacher that I had, history teacher. And so that was also the beginning of like another type of education, right? I ended up at Wesley and I majored in anthropology and African American studies. Sure. Um, and I got to Wesleyan already having an ethnic studies foundation. Yeah. Thanks to these two educators. Um, you know, I had a, a, a bunch of African-American literature classes because they, the school was trying to adapt to us as well. Sure. Um, by trying to, um, you know, modify the curriculum. And at the time, because we were the sort of experiment and it wasn't widespread, I really don't even know how much resistance there was or there wasn't. It was yeah. like we were an experiment and everyone kind of knew that. So we, there were like liberties that were taken um, that for that time were very progressive and, you know, pioneering and groundbreaking. Yeah. Um, so in that regard, I, I, you know, I see that as a great privilege. Sure. Um, I, one of my great like one of the things that disturbs me most and hurts me most and angers me and enrages me most is like you know having worked again in New York City public schools specifically in high schools and middle schools like when I see our young people leave high school with a sixth or seventh grade reading level or unable to write an essay or doing remedial math. You know, a lot of our young people in the city go on to like CUNY or, or community college and use up most of their student loan money taking remedial classes. Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. they don't have basic skills, you know? And I think, I, you know, having been through several generations of New York talking about, you know, revamping curriculum and going through all of these different waves of like trends in education that are supposed to improve public education, you know, I. I, I, I'm deeply disturbed because I'm like, we actually already have models in this city yeah. that work. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That work. Um, and I don't see those models being emulated necessarily. And, and like, even in terms of, interestingly, in a white prep school, in an independent elite school, is where I had the most culturally responsive education. Yeah. Outside yeah. of Mr. Thomas's class, right? And even Mr. Thomas was teaching us the American classics because he wanted us to be prepared for the real world and a rigorous education, which at that time was centered around the Western canon, right? Yeah. But yeah. In, in the context of this really elite school is where I had my first culturally responsive education. It's the first time I saw Eyes on the Prize. It's the first time I studied Black history and literature. It's the first time I studied Indigenous people. There was no Latino anything. Yeah. But <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you know, I studied Asian history. I remember taking the Bible as literature, yeah. you know? Um, and I ended up in my African-American studies concentration as religion. So, you know, it's where I studied the Bible. I was like, oh, I don't want to go to my grandma's church. So fine, I'll study the Bible as literature, you know? Um, and so I think like, you know, that's what Spence was for me. It was, it was a, it absolutely was. I took my first yoga class and like, you know, when I was 12 years old at Spence as a gym, as a gym elective, I took my first judo class as a gym elective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You know? wow. laughs> so I, I led clubs and, you know, participated. I, I understood the importance of an extracurricular life. Sure. Um, I had one of my first paid jobs as like an intern. My dad was actually organizing at the South Bronx Clean Air Coalition around an incinerator mm -hmm. that was going to be built in the South Bronx. And an older student who was part of the Student Environmental Action Coalition who lived in New Jersey but went to spend was like, oh, Student Environmental Action Coalition New York chapter is hiring interns and like we pay a monthly stipend and you can do any social action project that you want. And so my first paid organizing job, even though I never got paid to organize again, <laughs> but I was yeah. able to like be the intern for Seek New York, but working with the South Bronx Clean Air Coalition on the incinerator. Wow. You know, the opportunities that 
clearly were privileges and I never would have had, but I, I kind of managed to use the experience to like really like deepen my knowledge and understanding of things that were already important to me. Sure. Um, and it's honestly, like I said, it's what I wish for, for all students, for That's all, true. you know, the class and race tensions and dynamics aside. And I don't say aside to say that it's like, it's not important, but like, one of the things that my group of friends did and that the teachers who were allies to us did was like kind of like put our stake in the ground and say like we deserve to be here like yeah. none of us are here because someone felt uh, you, maybe they did pick us because they felt sorry for us but we actually were here because we're academically like competitive <laughs> because we worked our asses off to be there excuse my language we oh, worked no, we really hard <laughs> no we worked really hard to be here and like most of the people there maybe didn't work as hard their parents could afford the tuition you yeah. know what i mean yeah 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 for um, sure so we did feel some sense of like as hard as it was at times we had each other is the other thing um politically we started our seventh grade year two seniors who are graduating a Puerto Rican woman and um, a West Indian woman started as like their senior project, something called the Afro Latina Alliance of Spence, ALAS. Mm. And so I got to Spence when I think I was 10 or 11 years old. And like, that was the first club I joined. Wow, <laughs> so wow. even in terms of like political work, like it, it was like, and it, I already had this family experience of like working politically with black Americans and sure. feeling like, they're my people too and like my own black family like being very clear that Puerto Ricans are part of the African diaspora my mom was really clear like we're black even though we're light and we're this and we're mixed and we're that we're black too and so I already had that political foundation but like then I get to Spence and it's like okay now you're going to be in a club <laughs> that's called the Afro Latina Alliance in wow. 1988 wow wow yeah in 1988 and we that that organization still exists right um and I've had the opportunity as an alumni to go back and talk to them and even to talk to the whole school. Like one of the things that I've done is like, you know, to the degree possible when I've been asked, I've gone back as an alum to talk about either my work or alas or, you know, professional, like non-traditional <laughs> work tracks, career tracks. Um, because there are girls of color there and there are working class um, students there who sure. are navigating the same things in 2021 that we were navigating in 1988. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what about your experience at uh, Wesley? Would you like to share anything about that? <laughs> yeah, so I went to Wesleyan. And so, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that when it was time to apply for colleges, my college counselor, naturally it was like oh you should just apply to a bunch of SUNY schools and the prep program the preparatory program that helped me get the scholarship suspense was like absolutely not like based on your transcript and your extracurriculars you should be applying to like really competitive schools ivies blah 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 i got into 12 out of 13 colleges i only applied to two SUNYs and i'm talking cornell princeton blah yeah. blah blah the preparatory program was like you should go to princeton right? That's the school you should go to. It's Princeton. Why would you say no to Princeton? My heart was like, you should go to Wesleyan. Yeah. Like, because I had a bunch of, it's, I mean, teenage stuff. I graduated when I was 17. I was like, there are more people of color. It's a smaller school. Sure. My experience visiting Princeton was like the one person who toured me around was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I knew that I would have people there. Yeah. Um, from this high school network of color that I was a part of. And so I was like, it's only two hours, hour and a half away from New York. It's going to be lots of people of color. It's a little Ivy, so it's still academically rigorous. Yeah. Um, and, and I loved being there. Like, it, you know, when we had the pre-frosh weekend, it was like the most fun and freedom I had ever experienced. And this is like a note to parents, like <laughs> make sure, you know, while your kids are going a place and like, <laughs> make sure they have it. but really that was all that it was. It was like, I was like, all my friends are going to be here. It's super fun. I feel free. I love it. It's not too far. And I did want a small school. Yeah. Um, you know, Williams was the same kind of profile, but very con politically conservative. Wesleyan is like, you know, it's a lefty school, even though there's a conservative population at that time, it's become much more centrist. Um, but in the in the nineties, Wesleyan was a very like left, you know, a lefty kind of school. It was the, the furthest left among the little Ivies. 
Yeah. Um, and I had an amazing experience there. You know, I, I had a strong community there. I worked with the, you know, the Latino Latino organization, um, which is called Juan Campos. I lived in the Don Pedro Alviso Campos house. I worked with the Obini, which was an African diaspora women's collective. Um, I traveled to Brazil, you know, um, yeah. I studied what I wanted to study. <laughs> I think I took like two math classes that I was like, oh, do I really have? I think I took like math and society one and math and society two, because everything else was like politics, psychology, anthropology, religion, and literature, you know? Um, and, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was actually one of the best experiences of my life. Um, similar to my group of Spence friends, my Wesleyan friends are like family. Yeah. Um, and we're still connected to this day, you know, over 20 years later. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I could say about that. It, it was a wonderful experience, you know. It sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> um, and a couple, couple more things. We can either, um, you know, schedule another session. Let me just pause this first. All right. Yeah, so I think um, something really interesting that is, you know, obviously as someone who has benefited from the privilege of having access to, you know, the education that I've had, even when I was a Bronx public school student, right? Like gifted and talented in the Bronx is something that virtually like doesn't even exist. Like it does. I, my son actually got into a local gifted and talented program and um, it, was in, it wasn't up to par, which is why he didn't attend. Yeah. Um, but like education for me is like so critical, not just to like creating opportunities for material prosperity in, in people's lives, but it's like so critical to, to people's like um, opportunities for and, and ability to really like fully realize their potential Absolutely. as humans on the planet, right? Like having the privilege of just like exploring your interests and knowing what you don't know, being exposed yeah. to what you don't know. is like such a critical part of our development. Um, okay as human beings um you know as a parent i find it you, you know my all of those like educational experiences in tandem have really like obviously set a standard that i i desire for my child um that i'm unable to find and i am a, like a proponent of an advocate for and defender of like public education and public school students and families <laughs> right sure. But as a parent, and my son is a public school student in New York City at this time, but the, the hurdles and the sort of the labor that went into finding him a school yeah. that was a match for his needs, right? And my son does not go to school in the Bronx. He goes to school in Harlem. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, because I found like this great, small, progressive public school there that took a lot of hard work to get into. <laughs> Um, the fact that as a parent, you have to even know so yes. much, yes. right? And, and navigate, creatively navigate and assertively navigate and demand that the basic needs of your, for your child are met in the context of, of schooling, for me, is like one of the most important social issues of our time. Absolutely. Right? Um, because as I said before, I think every child deserves the opportunity to become fully whoever they're meant to become. Not every child is gonna ex uh, or, or, or achieve that, you know, it, because of academics. For some children, it's gonna be art, for others, athletics, for some, you know. But, but having an educational system that is open and adaptive enough to give children the opportunity to explore that yeah. um, is like an essential part, right? of, I believe, of creating a more equitable society. And, and I would say like the Bronx as, as the, I think we're the most marginalized borough as well, right? And yep. it is because we're a largely foreign working class borough, Definitely. even though there is some economic diversity, it is, it is the poorest borough in the city, <laughs> right? 100%, yeah. Um, I think like, you know, one of the things that I hope for, for our borough, for our people here, is, is just like more creativity, um, and also like a deeper commitment, right, on behalf of like our government and our public officials to create opportunities for our children, for our families that will nurture and cultivate everyone's like greatest potential, right? And like that would be for our highest good, Definitely. if that makes sense. Because like as a parent navigating 
you know, schooling and even like extracurricular activities. You know, the New York City is a city of haves and have nots. Like, and there's almost no middle anymore. So you either have to have the resources to pay for really expensive private resources or you're subject to public resources, which generally leave a lot to be desired. <laughs> um, and require so much work to even get things that are, you know, at least passable in some sort of way. You have to do so much work to even do that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think like for me, raising a son in the Bronx, I'm kind of at the crossroads now, whereas he, you know, because of his academic needs, right, because he is, you know, a, a scientist, yeah. not, not he, I don't know where he got that from, but he's a scientist, um, and requires a certain level of rigor just to be engaged, right? I'm sort of at the point where I have, I'm, I'm thinking about, well, do we get to stay here? Yeah. You know, can we stay here if I want him to have access to um all of the things I believe he and all children deserve definitely you know and I think that's a really hard question as like a lifelong Bronxite who loves my borough um who loves my community who who love who knows that there's actually like no place like New York and no place like the Bronx in the world yeah um even even in the context of New York City anybody who's from like the Bronx and Harlem and like Washington Heights it's almost like this <laughs> It, it's a it's uptown right uptown absolutely, absolutely. is a thing there's an identity here there's a culture here that is unlike the whole rest of the city oh absolutely um, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it's unique and it's a worldview and it's a it's also a political formation you know yeah. i think people from the bronx and people from uptown like we have solidarities and alliances that don't exist anywhere else in the city um and and that's something I'm grateful that my son was born here. He was born at Albert Einstein Hospital. Um, he was almost born in my apartment, but I made it out in time. <laughs> um, but he was born here. He went to St. Helena's for preschool. Um, and eventually, you know, when I worked in the city, he ends up going to school in Harlem. But he's a Bronx kid. And he's, he, he, I think he knows what that means. When we go other places and we travel, he's like, oh, like, we live in a place where we have everything, mom. Like, we have people from all over the world. And, you know, um, and he knows that it's dense and he knows that it's loud and he knows, you know, all of the things. <laughs> but it's home, yeah. you know. Um, and so I think, like, I, I, I don't know, I guess uh, my, my, um, uh, existential crisis is like you know how do you how do you keep home but also give children what they need if you have and it is a privilege to even be thinking about like leaving right yeah, yeah. but um but being who I am as a parent just being like I'm gonna fight tooth and nail to make sure he has everything he has educationally um just thinking through like what that means and, and then the anger associated with right having to think like why do I have to leave my home to get something so basic yeah absolutely absolutely a hundred percent. I mean, um, I guess I guess we'll see what happens now that at least um, uh, at least there was billions more in the la you know this last budget that was passed for New York State for um, for the complete you know all of the underfunded school districts in New York State. But there's so much more that needs to happen, um, and it might be too long in the making um, for you know, your son's education itself. So, yeah, but, but yeah, well, I, I realized here that we're um, at, at 1 p.m. So I know you have other things that you need to get off to. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.